Hello everybody, this is JackB1024 and welcome to episode 7 of our Dynamic Factory. So in today's episode, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting the build of our brain that will control this entire factory. Now, during the end of last episode, whilst I was building out our lovely main belt you can see over here, I thought up a few optimizations we can make to it. And we'll go further into detail on those optimizations at the end of the episode, but I'll at least explain it here. So if you look at the red science pack on this line, we know that red science can only go into this uh, science lab over on the right. But because our main belt has no idea where it can go, it has to spread it both to the east and to the west. So that means that we have a bunch of red science packs on our line going all the way to the west. Even though they're not going to be used in any of these locations over here. And of course, as we add uh, more and more banks to this, it would be spreading out even further, further to the west to more machines where it's completely useless. So yeah, we're going to fix, well, optimize that at the end of the episode. For the start, we're going to start off building our main circuit, our main brain that will control our factory. Now, firstly, we want to remove all these trees and with 0.15, I think it started with 0.15, but at least in one of the 0.15 versions, they added the ability to whitelist and blacklist deconstruction planners, as well as set them to remove only trees and rocks. So with that, we can easily just select all these trees and let our construction robots go and have their fun removing all those trees without actually removing all our circuitry we've got here and you know, this line we've got down here. And that's really useful. So we're going to actually we'll work yeah up here. This will be where we'll put our main drain. So there's going to be a few circuits I'm going to go through, which are going to be used a lot in our main brain. And so I think they're just useful right now to show how they work. So the first one we're going to go with is a simple, it's a, it's a timer. So we'll do that. So what we have here is a constant combinator uh, connected to a decider combinator. And this is going to be our timer. For our timer, we'll set each signal if it's less than a certain value, this can be, this is how long you want the timer to go for. Now, as the game runs at 60 ticks per second, let's just set this timer to be, there we go, 60 ticks long, which is one second. And output your input. Uh, you don't need to use each, you can also use a signal here. So for example, E and E, if you wanted. I'm just going with each, because it means that it doesn't actually matter what signal we put into the timer. And so this can be, you know, blueprinted down and maybe somewhere else you want to use a different signal. So let's just use the signal zero for the moment. And then you can see the signal zero counting up. And if we attach a light to it, and we set the light, if anything's greater than zero, it'll flash off once every second. So actually we'll set the time to everything equals zero and it'll flash on. Ah, everything equals zero. That obviously... Yeah, that can't work. Um, we'd need to actually check an individual signal. The reason is that the everything, each, and anything signals ignore any signal that's equal to zero. Uh, which makes sense if you think of having a circuit sort of like, make sure everything is greater than two, right? Ah, uh, everything actually. If we want everything greater than two, let's say we'll output our green signal and we'll hook that up to a light. We'll hook that up to a constant combinator on the other side. Right. And we'll set a p-value of five. That should turn you on. This light is not set to turn on. There we go. Anything greater than zero, it'll turn on. So you can see when the p is five, it's on. When the p is not five, Ah, yes. 
It needs to have at least two signals. It's kind of a bit weird how everything works. There we go. It must remember the last state. It was in. Yeah, I actually have a further look into that. That didn't work exactly how I expected, but yeah, I'll have a look into that later. But yeah, as you can see, checking signal zero equals zero, which it will be once every second. So this light will turn on for one tick every second. It's a simple timer setup. Uh, I, we're actually not going to use it as a timer. We're going to use it as a state machine. In fact, let's go over the design that we're going to actually use for our uh, main brain so that it actually makes more sense. So we're going to use a state machine, which basically means that it's going to have a signal that tells it what it's currently doing. And then it's going to basically just loop around four different actions. The first action it's going to do is it's going to read from each of these banks uh, the status of that bank. So it'll say, what, what, what state are you currently in? Uh, let's go to map mode so I can move. There we go. What state are you currently in? Okay, cool. What state are you in? Okay, cool. What state are you in? What state are you in? You, you, and it'll it'll just go through every single bank. So that's its first state. So that's going to be its its read state, and it's going to store that in its own memory. The second state it's going to have is a is a computing stage. So it'll look at its memory, look at what it wants to get to, and just work out. Okay, what do I need to change? And that's going to take, you know, a variable amount of time, depending on how, what it's got going on. That's actually going to be probably the most complex stage in our circuit. And then the third stage, and so with the second stage, uh, on the output of that, it's going to set a different set of memory cells, basically saying, okay, I've worked out, you know, maybe I want this to now, this red sign's back, I want it to now make green ones. And this belt area, I want it to now make a uh, military science pack, maybe, just as an example. And maybe that's all the changes it wants to do. And so on the third stage, the third stage is going to have the output from the second stage as its input. And it's basically going to go, okay, so which banks do I need to change? And it will just tell them to change. So it'll say like, hey, bank two, make green science. Hey, bank three, make military science. And then it's done because that's all the changes it wanted to make. And then the fourth stage is just going to be a simple, uh, it's going to be a simple like timer waiting stage. I guess waiting is the best term for it. Uh, so it's actually going to just do nothing. It's just going to sit around, wait some amount of time and then start again. So the way we're going to control our stages is similar to how a timer circuit works where we're going to have, what's our signal going to be for our stage? Let's use the signal S, S for stage. Now the stages are going to be numbered 0, 1, 2, 3. So as long as our stage is less than 4, output what stage we're in. And that way we connect the output to the input. And if we actually connect this up to our combinator, we just have, again, a timer circuit. Uh, let's connect four lights here. And we'll say if s equals zero, whoop, this is going to get very flickery. I don't want it to be super flickery. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the timer circuit we just had. So this one only ticks every second. And what we're going to do, uh, yep, we want that into a decider combinator. Is we're going to say whenever zero is zero, so once every second, output a single one of S. So that means that this stage only changes once every second now instead of every single tick. Which means that these lights won't be as stroby and as annoying. There we go, S equals zero. 
one, two, and that's meant to be a three. There you go, so now these lights tell us which stage we're on. So stage zero, one, two, three. And there you go, and you'll see it just loops through those four stages. So, that's this single decider combinator set up correctly. The other three are just to show that this works. We're going to have to use a different method to actually change the other th to change the value for this. Now, an important thing to notice is that my loopback wire, the one going from the output to the input, you notice that it's red on both of these, while the wire that I'm reading from on the output is green. Now, the, the reason for this is if you notice on the input side, our input into this decider combinator that's changing it is also on the red line. And that's why I've had to go with the green line. If we instead getting random lag spikes. Um, there we go. We instead went with the red line. So this is set to light up whenever zero is zero. And I'll put one right next to it, connected to the green line with the same settings. And you see that the right one's turning on and off every second but the left one's never turning on. And the reason it's never turning on is if we connect, there we go, if we connect the red line up to this, you'll see, which we probably won't manage to see, but the actually you can notice the zero signal's never disappearing. And the reason is because we're always getting a zero signal of one out from this constant combinator. It's on the same red line, and so it's always on this red line, there's that signal. Now you could always fix this by connecting the input to the green line. That way it's not connected to its own output. And now you notice that they both flash on. That's just a uh, thing to remember whenever you're dealing with any circuit that connects its input to its output. Also remember that any input into that combinator on the same cut of the line will instantly be on the same output. So that's that. So the next question is, how do we nicely make this tick forward without using this, this timer circuit that we've got going on here? So let's say, you know, we're doing our processing on stage two and it wants to signify, okay, I'm done, you can go to the next stage. How do we make it signify that? So for that, we're going to use a pulse generator. I'm just thinking, how to nicely show how a pulse generator works. Think. Yeah, that should hopefully be enough. So what a pulse generator will do, and we'll connect your green to that, yeah. So we'll set this up to output signal zero. And these lights will both turn on when signal zero is greater than zero. So you can see when that's off, they're off. When it's on, they're on. So, you know, this could be signal S as its input to this, telling it, okay, go to the next state. Now the issue is obviously both these lights are constantly on. And if they're constantly on, this is going to keep ticking out one tick per tick. So that's why I added this arithmetic combinator. And what it's going to do is it's going to say, for every signal, multiply it by negative one, and then output it again. Now, a thing to remember with all combinators, always remember that they take one tick to change their output depending on their input. So if we actually go down here to my lovely sign that I made, you'll notice that each of these combinators are just set up to get the input and output it again. But the input on the red line this is probably an easy one to say. You see its input from its red line is the output of the previous one. And that's how they're all set up. So the input is the previous one's output, which means that each of these actually take a tick to uh, get the new input from the one before it, which is what gives you this sort of uh, swiping effect on this display because this one takes a tick to update and then the next tick, this one updates, then this one, then this one, then this one, each one taking us extra tick. And so that's important here because we want to take a signal that's infinitely long. So on for a, a 
infinite amount of time. And we want to turn this on only on the single tick that it turns on. So if we get the one tick that it turns on, and then we negate it, and that takes one tick to do, then for every tick after then, we're going to be off. And I can actually show that by turning this combinator on. You know, so this one only flashed on for a moment there. And the reason why that is, is for the first tick, this is outputting a one on the green line, and that goes straight to this layer. So it's fine, it's on. This arithmetic combinator for that tick is outputting nothing. Because when that, see, it's outputting nothing at the moment. So it would still be outputting nothing. Then on the next tick, this thing's computed. Okay, I've got an input of one, so I should output negative one. So in the green line now, we have a negative one coming from this arithmetic combinator, and we've got a one coming from the constant combinator. One plus minus one is zero, so this is now getting zero. And so this is a simple tick generator. Now you might think that's fine. We've got everything we need now, so we just connect you know, uh, this up to the green line. Set this to zero. Zero is less than four. Output zero, so this is now our signal counter. And in fact, we're in a really bad state for this at the moment. Uh, actually, no, it doesn't matter. Just turn it off. Actually, we are in a bad state. I forgot those things can easily go negative. Okay, so. Hmm. Yeah, that should work. There, yeah, cool. I don't know why it wasn't. Oh, because, yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I made a mistake, but now it's working fine. Okay, so as you can see, now it has a signal of one. You used to have a signal of zero because our light ticked on for only one tick, so it only counted once. Now, if we were to turn this off, you'll now notice that this has a signal of zero. Now, why did that happen? Well, let's look at the state that this is on, right? At this moment, this is outputting a negative one. This is outputting a positive one, and that's what gets you zero. Now, on the very next tick, this is going to turn off. So this is going to be outputting zero. However, this arithmetic combinator will still be outputting a negative one. And so on this green line, we've now got a value of negative one. And because this will just count up its inputs, it's getting a one on the red line from its state. And it's getting a negative one from the green line, which makes it go back to zero. So the very simple change to this to make sure that that doesn't happen. In fact, if we add an extra light here, we make this light light up when it's less than zero. You'll notice that this light lights up when we turn it off because it's setting out a negative one signal. So the simple way to fix it, just remove them from there and connect it. We'll use a decider combinator and we'll say, no matter what signal you get, if it's greater than zero, then pass it through. So if it's zero or less, ignore it. If it's positive and greater than zero, uh, pass it through. And that way, I should have kept this slide here so I could prove that it works for negative numbers now. As you see, when we turn off, the light doesn't turn on. But when we turn it on, the light does. And so we can just hook that into our our simple state thing. Set it up again. And now you'll see it's on zero. Turn it off, it stays on zero. Turn it on, it's on one. On, it's on two. On again, it's on three. And on again, it's back to zero. So this circuit here, this tick former, this will be on every single section where our state machine runs so you know we'll have you know the section to read the blocks to compute them to write them into wait each of them is going to end up with one of these uh, signal setups that's just going to tell the signal to go to the next state the next thing we're going to need is what is a mutex or a selector or a switch statement you could Kind of give it all those names. Kind of works like a switch statement in programming languages. 
And so what that does is it's similar to these lights. So these lights are turning on if S is 0, 1, 2, and 3. But let's say, uh, let's do it in a similar sort of fashion. So I'll have four lights here. Just trying to lay everything out in my head. We use these for our switch statement. We use the same green line. At the moment, I'll just connect them directly, and we'll have a red line connected. So let's say, hmm, actually that could theoretically work the way I'm thinking of doing it. So we'll actually ignore that. So I don't want to make it confusing how it works. Yeah. So let's say we wanted these lights. We want the top one to turn on on signal zero, the next one on signal one, two, and three. And really, these lights are just kind of dim. Um, they're in place of a whole, you know, complex circuit that does stuff. Because we want our circuit that reads from these, we want these only to read at state zero. We want the circuit that computes stuff only to compute when it's in state one. We want the circuit that writes our computed stuff to only write that and update those banks on state two. And we want our waiting state to only wait on state three. So we'll connect this input to each of these. And we'll connect this red line. This red line is just going to act as a sort of, this is just some data coming in. All right. And we want the data only to go to the single light that it's concerned with. And our data will make it a color. So our data screen. And each of these lights will turn on whenever they're getting any data. And they'll use, there we go. And they'll use the color to light up. So how do we set this up? Um, hmm. This actually isn't going to work, so I would need an extra line color for the way that I normally do this. So we'll make this a simple way for the moment. So, ooh, no. Yeah, no, this isn't going to work like this. And the reason it's not going to work is I want, if this is sending no data, I don't want any of the lights to turn on. So that's the other restriction we have. So we actually need a setup. A setup like this. So all of these are just going to pass the signal through. So you might think, well, that's weird. Why are you passing it through four different arithmetic combinators? And the reason for that is that this means instead of being on one single green line, we've now got four separate lines we could use. So you'll see, oop, there we go. Each of these lines are now separate. And there's our connection lines. So going back to the circuit we just had, we just added this line of arithmetic combinators. And these are again just set to, if they've got a signal, turn on. And if it's a color signal, they'll turn on that color. And yeah, we'll have you on the screen. So if we go with the circuit that I was going to have, I can actually show why it wouldn't work. S is one, S is two, and S is three. There we go. Why is, oh, because I thought I put in, no, that's one. What am I doing? Oh, I, oops. Okay, there we go. So now you can see this is turning on. And we can say, well, this is working. We're getting a color in, it's turning on. But what happens if we give it no signal? We see the lights are still turning on. At least the bottom three are turning on. And the reason for that is we're outputting every input signal we get. So for our S is 1, we're going to output everything, and that will of course include our S signal. So these lights are turning on because they're getting an S on their output. And that's why this layout like this 
with just uh, the single decider commutators and the lamps wouldn't have worked. So the way we're going to fix this is we're going to have, you don't need the top constant combinator but just to make it all symmetrical and the same we're going to use it. We're going to connect an extra constant combinator to each of these green lines here. And what this constant combinator is going to be in charge of is getting rid of the yes signal basically. So we want this one to turn on when s is 0, which means that we've already got no s signal, we're fine. We want this one to turn on when s is 1, but we don't want that to be an s signal. So what we'll do is we'll send an s signal of negative 1 on this constant combinator. Yep. And now, because this is now sending out a negative 1, instead of looking for the signal of 1, we want to look for a 0. In fact, that's how all of these are going to work. So this one is going to have an s value of negative 2, and this one's going to have an s value of negative 3. And now you can see when our signal's on, our lights are turning on. When this is off, our lights aren't on. And you know, if this had some data, let's say Q, our lights will turn on with white. But that's fine because we're only sending through our data, which is the uh, signal Q. And that's why we had to break up this green line, because we needed an extra line to send through these constant combinators with the s's negative 1, 2, and 3 to these decider combinators. And if we just hooked it up where all the green lines are connected, uh, the constant combinators would have been connected to the same line. And so that's why this line of arithmetic combinators are there. So this is basically a, a switcher. So depending on our input signal, what our s signal is, we can decide where the data will go to. Now this is going to be useful in both our memory bank as well as selecting which uh, which part of our frame to run. I think I think that's us mostly done with our high level sort of looking at the circuits and how they're going to work. So let us quickly just make a, we'll make a very quick setup of all four steps. Uh, yep. So we'll have our arithmetic combinator, which will be our isolator this will select only for one signal and this will be for our getting everything from the banks and then I'll put another one down here here and here we'll just set this up first so everything plus zero I'll put everything that doesn't actually need to output anything and our signal is s we want to make sure it equals zero and then we can output everything that goes there to there Yep, and that's all wiring we need. So we'll put another one here, another one here, and a fourth one here. So the output connects to each of these. Okay. Now, for, as for ticking onto the next state, we're going to just control that by, at the moment, a simple constant combinator. And I'll just put that, put that down here. Yep. So again, everything times negative one, output it all, everything greater than zero, output it. Green connects to both the inputs and our red will connect from this output to this input. And that's all we need for our circuit to take it to the next state. We're going to want to connect that either to the red or the green line, depending on which side of the input we want to connect it to. I'm going to connect it to a... I'm going to connect it to a red line. Yep. Yeah. 
And the reason I want to connect it to a red line is, you know, eventually these things are going to move around. And so what we can do if we have it like this is we can have the input. So we can have the green line which goes into the selector connected like that. And we can have the red line connected to the same set of electric poles and connected there. So now if I set on S is one, that'll take it to the next state. And because we actually have no uh, circuitry making sure that the correct state is telling it to tick on, I can actually just use one of these to tick it on to each state. That's fine for the moment. Now that took, that took longer to explain than I was hoping. Uh, so let's at least just set up this simple system down here. So this is on state negative three. I'm going to add an extra signal to the green line and I'm going to set this signal to hmm. let's just set it to zero for the moment okay yep, that's right okay this should have s as negative one no, 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 no. This should have S as negative 1. This should have S as negative 2. And that has... No, I did it wrong again. This one here. Okay. And that has S as negative 3. We'll get down to the correct state. Okay, so we're in the timer state. So as you can see, this is outputting a zero signal of one. We'll use that to signify that we want our timer to run. I'm gonna think about that because I might want to change how that actually works. Yep. So how are we gonna get our timer to run? Now we only want it running when it's meant to run. So when this is getting a signal of zero out of here. So we'll have a simple timer here. We'll make it just wait. Uh, let's make it wait two seconds. Okay. Now we can connect that just to the output. We'll see that'll count up every two seconds. And then what we want to do is we want to say when our timer equals 119, we'll output S of 1. Yep, that works fine. And then we'll output that that line. So now if we again go back down to our timer, our timer will run and after two seconds, okay, I'll look into that in a sec, that makes sense. After two seconds it'll count down to the next one. So that's the fourth stage done. Now you'll notice this actually has a zero signal of four, and the reason for that is if you remember, each arithmetic combinator takes a tick to propagate its signal through. So there's actually a couple of ticks delay between this thing telling it to go to the next state and then actually going to the next state. I don't think that's too much of a problem because it's always going to. Mm. That does mean our timer will be slightly off. So I'll think about uh, changing that, but our timer's not too important. 
It's just to slow down the first three stages. Okay, so that's the very start of our main brain. So I'm thinking, do I explain the optimization of the main belt or do I do another section of the main brain? Because we're running at about half an hour already. Okay, so I decided uh, I'll finish off this episode talking about the optimizations to the main belt. Uh, mainly because the next part of the brain would take a while to explain and work out. So I think this will be just a quicker way to finish off the episode. So as I was mentioning, the issue is that we have no system at the moment of knowing whether or not we need to send red science back to the east or to the west here. Or any of the um, components for that matter. And that means that every new bank we add onto the end is going to be filled up with, you know, a bunch of items for every single belt that we have. And, you know, a lot of those items probably aren't going to be used. In fact, our last two banks aren't being used for everything. So every single item on these two belts is completely useless being there because none of them are going to be used. So the way I thought about fixing this is if you remember we have these constant commators which are going to be part of our circuit that it's scanning to remember what it wants on each belt and they tell us what's on this belt on the left right this one on the left right and this one on the left right so my thinking is we can use this to tell us what item we need in this bank so for example in this bank we need just iron plates in this bank over here we need you know every science pack except for the white ones in this bank here, we need gear wheels and copper plates, and so on and so forth. I haven't actually got this set up for future banks to the right. No. Left. Yeah. Uh, but that's fine. So we know which items we need. But we only care... Um... We don't care which lane they need to be in, we just care that we need them. So I'm going to say for everything, for the moment we'll just say greater than zero, that's actually going to change. Output one of that item. So this says we need iron plates here. You know, if I put that, this one here. Hopefully that got it, yep. There. We need one of each science back. This is just uh, emulating what these do. So now we have a signal that tells us what we need at this bank. So now all we need is two signals. We need one signal telling us everything we need at the bank to the right of where we currently are, and everything we need to the bank at the left in the other signal. So I'm going to use yeah, I'm going to use the red wire, the red wire for the right and the left wire for the left, uh, the green wire for the left, there we go. So shall we use probably a large electric for this. Um, where are we gonna hook them together? So let's, let's look at this spot here. Yeah, cause it, it'll be in between the two banks that we need to update everything. So we'll set it up here. then you also need to go that direction. Okay, well, we'll set this up and then we'll see how nice it looks. So red's to the right. So you have to go to this one and green is to the left. So you go that way. I'm gonna put them on here. Then we're gonna have to take red off. And green off. So we'd actually need two of these. Which 
three. Okay, well, we'll go with two and we'll just see how this goes. Now, mm, no, these should be decider combinators, not arithmetic. These are just set up exactly the same. So everything greater than zero, output it. Hmm. I'm actually going to connect the green wire. And the reason for that is that our red wire will store which one's on the right. And we don't want uh, cross contamination between what this green wire is outputting and what this red wire here is adding to this decider combinator. Ah, that was on the wrong side. Don't think that can even reach. Could flip that around. Import output. Okay, cool. So now this one has on it red and green signals, and that has green. Good. So green says to the left of this bank, so this split down here between these two banks, we need iron plates. And this is to the right of it, we need our science packs. So that works fine. Take this across and we'll put it we'll put it here. Yeah. This is probably missing. Yeah. Then we we'll put a bunch of them. Okay, cool. Now our red and green wire will just hook up straight between these. Yep. And oh yeah, we need another decider come later there. So that's telling us we need, you know, iron plates and copper gears. Now, the issue I have now is that there's no way to get this signal from here over to the inputs for this one. That's why I was thinking that we may actually need another pole. And this time, this is to the right, but we have to use the opposite colored signal. So this is gonna use the green one and it will go to there. And that should, yeah, the only green signal coming to it is the one from that wire. This green signal goes to the output here. This one gets the red and it connects to that one. And so then we can just continue this on and on and on. And so you can see now from this signal, this is telling us that, you know, to the right we need science, to the left we need copper and gear. And this one, because this one's for this bank here, to the left we need, you know, iron plates as well. And so these colors could run, uh, these wires could run down here. They would run, okay, this is an annoying spot in particular because, because this doesn't have the output belt. It's a slightly different setup here, so we'll actually look over here. So here's our break between our two, uh, two types of circuits. Well, two directions, our west and our east. And so we can run the output of these two. Just give this a medium electric pole. So you're outputting on the red line, you're outputting on the green line. And these can run, these are positive. So, yep, positive is what we want. Um, hmm, it's positive what we want. So we need to enable these only if they need that item in that direction. So right is red, so this would be enabled. We'll enable this one because this one goes to the right. Wait. Yeah, because these need it. 
So this one's enabled because this needs iron plates. Yep, that makes sense. But we can't just do a simple equals zero. It's because if you remember the way we do all these circuits is to check that everything is zero. But this is telling us more than just one thing. This is telling us everything that we need in that direction. So it may actually be useful to instead negate everything. So we're getting negative ones instead. Instead of greater than, we'll use less than, oh, but then we can't use, hmm. Oh no, I've, I've got it, I've got it. Figured it out. It's, it's a bit annoying, but it'll work. What we'll need to do, yep, we'll need an extra arithmetic combinator here. We'll take your red input to there. Take your green output to there, and we'll negate them at this spot. So this is telling us uh, the same thing. Well, no, but it's no longer preserving red and green. Okay, so we need two. But, yeah. Everything negated. Everything negated. Green output goes to that one. There we go. Red output goes to that one. This is telling us. Oh, I'm just times it by zero. There we go. Negative one, negative. Good. Okay. And then. Do that. Okay. So now we have each signal set to negative one. And this is where we're going to go kind of against our normal convention of checking that everything is zero. I think we're going to check instead that if anything is negative two. Because we can do that check and that would work. However, that wouldn't work if our thing is zero. That is our circuit, our, um, our line needs nothing on it. In that case, we we still want to be able to move stuff around to get rid of it all. Hmm. I thought I'd figured this out. I mean, at least this way can work. Um, the only issue being that we do actually need iron in this direction, but we don't say it yet. Oh, I know, I know. Here we go. Mm, turn you off just for the moment while we change these values and turn you back on. Now I put in 1024, which is a power of two greater than what any of these will say. So see, none of these are asking for iron plates. Well, this one is saying that we need iron plates because it's getting a signal from here. So that means on our green and our red, we'll be getting iron plates, which is good. So, green is to the left and we'll put it on both of these and red is to the right um, anything has to equal negative 2 for them to be enabled and we'll connect the red wire up to these two and that will connect to the wire that contains what's on this belt which is here does it go down nope I'm just there okay the green and that doesn't reach because it doesn't reach um yeah. it's getting to be quite a nest of wires okay there we go as you can see these are enabled and this one's enabled because we need iron plates to the right and iron plates to the left 
Cool, but if we turn this one off, we wouldn't need iron plates to the left anymore. And so these turn off. Okay. I'm going to think about how to make it work when we don't need anything on this line to make sure that the line's always enabled as well. Yeah, I need to think of how to do that. Um, but I'll think of that between the break of the two episodes. Okay. Thank you, Autosave. Oh, and I didn't even do any research or talk about it. Um, so during the break, I'm just going to pump out some researchers. Uh, we want to get train set up next. The main reason being that every bank we add here, we're going to have to add another line. And as you can see, it's getting pretty long anyway. There's already, I think it's 11 different lines. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's 11 banks and... Yeah, 11 lines. So if we added another bank, we need another line as well. And so this would just get very large very quickly. However, with trains, uh, multiple trains can just run on the same line, so we don't actually need you know, a bunch of lines. And trains are going to be going to little factories that are set up the same as this anyway. Uh, and they're going to be all dynamic as well. So I think going for trains would be useful. So that's what we're going to do uh, in the break. That's probably all I'm going to do in the break is do that and figure out how to fix up this issue. Otherwise, until next time, this is Jack Bay 1024 signing off. Have a good day.